Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Donnelly, and today I'm going to talk about using an intermediary language in field work, asking the question, is there a gap in our training? And spoiler alert, I think there is. So that's what I want to talk about today. So let's look at some basics here. Then we'll uh, look at a quick case study. Um, we'll look at our results from a survey, and then we'll wrap up with some re recommendations. So I'm using the term intermediary language to refer to a, ling a language that a linguist uses in the field that is not the linguist's mother tongue. It may or may not be the mother tongue of the speech community. And I'm using the term target language to refer to a language that is being studied or documented by a linguist. So from my own experience, for example, um, I use Mandarin to do field work in China um, with a language uh, called Kadzo. So Mandarin, not my native language, um, and it's also the second language of the people in the village. So I'm excluding here situations in which um, linguists and speech communities share a mother tongue and situations in, when no, in which no one shares anything, but they're using a translator. Now, the key thing here is that for those of us who use an IL to do field work is that the IL is basically a filter through which everything has to pass in both directions, both from the language being studied to the mother tongue of the linguist. And so that, um, well, that there's pros and cons to it. Sometimes it's helpful to have the IL and sometimes the IL is an obstacle. So this is the kind of thing I wanna talk about today. So just quickly, a brief uh, story about uh, one of the situations in which Mandarin was an obstacle for me came about when I was studying the aspect markers of Kadzo. Now, Kadzo is a Tibeto-Burman language. Um, so it is distantly related to Mandarin and it does share um, certain construction. So in many cases, it's helpful to go from one to the other. But one thing that is very different is that Kazo has a lot more grammatical particles than Mandarin does. And in translation, what I find is that many particles get mapped on to one single particle in Mandarin. So for example, wa, 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 these are three different aspect markers. They all get translated as la in Mandarin. Now, la is multifunctional in Mandarin. If you know Mandarin well enough, you can sort of piece this out. But I had a bigger problem with the three imperfective markers, da, zha, zhou. Um, they all get translated as ja in Mandarin, and ja is not multifunctional. So this was a big challenge. How do I separate these particles, specifically the bottom two, zha and zhou? I tried every, every, everything I could think of, months and months of testing and trial and error and getting nowhere. And finally, I, I decided to sit down with this story that had this particular example in it, because this example has both of those particles I couldn't figure out in a single um, complex clause. And so I figured if I could figure the story out deeply enough, I would figure it out overall. So I sat down with my poor long suffering language consultant and we went through the story line by line by line. I was trying to make sure that there was no context that I wasn't getting. And I did that all the way up, this happens about midway through the story, all the way up to this line, and I still was not any clear what was going on. And so I was like, what's going, what are they, what are they wearing? What did they have for breakfast? I was trying to, anything I could think of that would help me figure this out. And my assistant pointed out that of course, this woman who was gonna go sell eels that day was using this certain kind of basket. Now it's not mentioned in the story, but is the key to understanding what's going on. So the particular basket they're using, and there are many different kinds of baskets for many different things um, in Kadzo, is a basket that you wear on your back like a backpack. It has arm straps. And so you put it on and you basically wear it around on your back for the entire time that you have it on. So, but, but meanwhile, at the same time frame you're doing that, you're then selling small batches of eels to various passersby. So this suddenly made it clear to me that zha, or in, the, in this instance, zh, also a variant, um, is, is the continuous marker because you're wearing the basket continuously on your back. At the same time, you are having repeated selling events. So zo is the iterative marker. So this took me months and months and months to figure out. And the problem was that Mandarin was the obstacle because Mandarin is much simpler in its grammatical particles than Kadzo. And I didn't expect this. I mean, I had a lot of training in field work before I went. Um, and uh, I probably a year and a half in the classroom. 
Um, my PhD specialization is language documentation. I went to the first two Colangs when they were called Infield. I talked to and networked with a lot of uh, field workers who work in China. And basically the main thing they said was, do you know Mandarin? I said, yes. And they said, oh, you'll have no problem. Well, that wasn't actually true. There are, you do run into problems. And this is the kind of problem that really made me think about this issue. And much like the guy who trips on the sidewalk and turns around to see what he trips on, I turned around to see how did I trip on this? How did I not know that this was going to come? And so I went back to the literature. Now, I'd read a number of field work manuals before I went, but I, I tried to do a deeper dive and see what kind of literature I could find on the how to's of doing field work and what did they have to say. Now, I'm not claiming this, this list is exhaustive, but it's nearly so, I think. I went all the way back to Margaret Mead in 1939. Most recent work is uh, Chelia 2016. Um, and I can tell you that all the works that are listed in white here are um, do not even mention using an intermediary language, not once. The works in blue mention it, but for most of them, it is a brief mention. The only work that goes into a little bit of detail, Chelia and Derus 2011, um, does not actually mention the fact that an IL could potentially be an obstacle at times, nor does it list any strategies for dealing with that issue. So I would say definitely a gap in the literature. So this made me want, oh, before I go on to the next thing, a quick aside here, those works that mention IL as a brief aside, many of them say something like this. Yeah, if you have to use an IL, all right, but really you should get in there and get fluent in the TL before you do any real work, okay? So I agree, it's always good to become fluent in the TL, most linguists don't have the time or the budget constraints to allow them to do such a thing. Um, and so I find this a little bit unrealistic. Also, we have to face the fact that the IL is probably the language you know, you need to know to get it, to do live and work in the area where you wanna do field work. It's the lingua franca in that region. Uh, you can't do field work in, in China without knowing Mandarin. And by the way, there's no one has classes on Kadzo anywhere, not even in the village where they speak it itself. So, but I can learn Mandarin before I get there. So this is the language you're likely to be able to learn before you go. So an IL is important. And we should all just, just remember that the need for language documentation is so great that we should not create unrealistic expectations about what you should do or what you need to do. I don't claim to be fluent in Mandarin, but I'm conversational. I can talk to speakers of Kadzo, I can document the language just fine. So I think we need to be a little bit more realistic here overall. So again, looking at my stub toe, I was trying to figure out, well, what did I miss? What didn't I get? What training didn't I have? And so I decided to reach out to a bunch of field workers to see um, what their experience is with this issue. So I put together a, a survey on SurveyMonkey, reached out in a lot of ways to reach a lot of different kinds of folks. I was very gratified that two, more than 200 field linguists responded. They didn't all answer every question. As you'll see, we're gonna look at a couple of the questions. Um, but generally, I want to know what their background was, what their training was, how they use an IL, um, if they'd run into problems and how they dealt with it. And by the way, the fieldwork sites of these folks spanned the globe, everything, every continent but Antarctica, and they use a wide variety of intermediary languages. So pretty broad-based response, I feel. So one of my questions was, how did you learn fieldwork skills? Now, you could choose more than one option here. Um, so this adds up to more than 100, but we see that 75% took university courses like I did. 45% um, went to specialized workshops like Colang or 3L, like I did. 40% uh, worked side by side with an experienced linguist. And so that's obviously going to be helpful. I did not do that. I was on my own. 30% have read some of the literature. So uh, that's like me. And intriguingly, 20% had no formal training whatsoever. I'm very curious about that, but anyway. So I asked, were issues related to using an IL discussed in your training? About two thirds said no, but I was surprised that as many as one third said uh, yes. So apparently there is some discussion about this happening out there, but um, it's maybe happening in one-on-one -on -one classes or conversations and not maybe spread throughout the, the field. Do you wish you'd had more training on these issues? Um, and again, about two thirds said yes, one third no. 
And did the features of the IL itself ever hinder you in analyzing the target language? This is, was my situation, right? That the IL became an obstacle at times. And again, about two thirds said yes as well. So kind of we're seeing some consistency across these questions. So I asked if the IL um, created problems for your analysis, what kinds of problems did you have? And we have a number of different things here and it might be easier to think of these in terms of buckets. So the top response here um, circled in red at the bottom, more than 60% of the folks had this problem is that um, in talking, using the IL to talk to speakers of the target language, responses were overly influenced by the IL. So I had this problem, right? People talking to me um, in, in Kadzo and Mandarin at the same time, their Kadzo became Mandarinized. Um, and I think we all are aware that this problem may happen and, and there are ways to get around this. The next bucket is um, the translation issue. So remember I said that the IL is a filter. So it's difficult enough to translate between just two languages, but essentially when you're doing this kind of work, you're having to translate across three, from the target language to the IL and then the IL to the linguist mother tongue or whatever language the linguist is using to write up their, their, uh, their um, information. And so this causes a problem in both directions. And then the third bucket is the, op is the structure problem that, that I ran into that the um, morphosyntactic structure of um, the IL was very different than that of the target language. Um, more than 30% had the situation, situation I had where the IL was simpler, but um, about 8% had the issue where the IL was more complex. But if you have a really very different structures that you're having to, to work through, then that causes problems. And then the last bucket here is basically just difficulty in understanding individual morphosyntactic particles in general, and that's always a challenge no matter how you're doing field work. So then I was curious, well, what did you do to overcome these problems if you ran into them? And I'm not gonna go through all of these in, in a lot of detail. I'll do that in the next slide when we talk about recommendations. But what we see here is that the most commonly used um, fixes, ranging between 50 and 60%, uh, of the folks basically had to do with uh, methodologies that let you get around the IL. You could sort of step away from the influence of the IL in many cases. And then uh, 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 the three beyond the, the, that bucket um, are these. One, um, nearly 40% basically looked to see how people had documented or described languages that were really closely related. This might give you some hints. Now, they may not find the same thing, but it might give you a sense of what other people did in similar circumstances. And then 15% said they trained their own consultants to do language analysis. And um, that's always great when you can do it. It takes a certain amount of time and it takes language consultants who are interested in learning that kind of stuff. And then um, roughly 50% also uh, had recourse to a translator. Um, and so maybe that could help in some instances. So what do we walk away with here? What are recommendations I'm putting forward to dealing with this? Well, the top one is this, like any good 12-step program will tell you, in order to deal with the problem, you need to admit that there is a problem. And I think we just, in general, to need to speak a lot more about the fact that many people do field work using an IL, that it is possible to do, that there are pros and cons to using an IL. It shouldn't prevent you from doing it, but you should be aware of that going in. And there should be more discussion about what are the pros and cons and how do you get around those cons? How do you avoid tripping over them like I did? So this is why I wanted to have this talk and I'm basically challenging everyone who has a role in, in training or preparing anyone for going into field work to add this to the overall checklist of things to talk about. Secondly, I think we should try to create more practice sessions about uh, in which we use an IL to do field work. Now, this is not possible everywhere. I teach field methods at a university. It is a required course in our curriculum. And there is just no way that I can um, force everyone to be conversational in Mandarin or Swahili or even Spanish before they take that course. Not gonna happen. But there are places where there could be 
critical mass, let's say a handful of folks that are all gonna use the same kind of IL. And we could be having practice sessions in these kinds of places. So the places where we gather together like Colang, LSA Summer Institute, 3L, ICLDC, et cetera, this could all happen. Now I know this happened at least at one Colang where one of the practica uh, was set up where everyone was gonna use Spanish to uh, work on a, a, a South American language. But it really should be something that Colang is doing every time if it can. Or at least since you, again, you may have the, the right people in the right place, is this may not be a, a structure class, it may just be a weekend workshop, a weekend jam session, an evening discussion, right? Um, where maybe you could, you could get this kind of thing off the ground. Um, it also so happens, I know, I know of universities like this, where there are numerous faculty people and students who are all basically working in the same region and therefore using the same IL. And so this might be another place where you could create some kind of practice session on an ad hoc basis um, to help prepare people uh, to go. And then also, again, if we add this to our normal checklist, this should be something that people who are preparing to go to the field uh, and who know they're gonna use an IL, this is one of the things that they ask about. This is one of the things that they talk to um, people who've already been there about how this works. And on the people, on the side of the people who have more experience doing this kind of thing, you should add this to your checklist of things that you want to bring up with people as they're preparing for field work. And um, I'm volunteering that I will talk to anyone about using a Mandarin who wants to go to China. I already talked to a lot of people uh, before they go to China, and this should, is, should just be one of those things that we add to the list to speak of. So that's things that I think we can all sort of do. And then when it comes down to methodologies, there are things that you can do. And I think we all need more training um, in how to do them. And so they become top of mind in what we do. So the third one here is more training and non-translational techniques. And this is my cover term for a variety of things where you are manipulating phrases and structures in the target language, even if you're then having a conversation about them in the IL. So for example, um, and this is one of the things that I tried to do and I've done successfully in other parts of Kazo, but didn't work so much for the, for the aspect markers was what happens if I swap these out? What happens if I put this, substitute this particle for another particle? Now, what is this new meaning? How does it work? What kind of situation would you use, use this in? These side conversations can be had in the intermediate layering language, but we're all focused on a grammatical natural Fraser construction in Kodzo. So this can be helpful, can be helpful in, in inventing um, context, different scenarios. What would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? Who would you use this with? Have you ever heard this used before? These kinds of things. Paraphrasing, like can I find another way in the target language to say something very similar? Or creating sentences that um, have blanks in them and then ask people to fill them in to see what they might volunteer. These are all ways to, um, to try to get around the IL somewhat. The fourth one is using nonverbal stimuli. Now, I think everyone is very familiar with these. Um, we've got you know, videos like Pear Story. We have picture books like Frog, Where Are You? and many others. Um, we've got um, diagrams and drawings. Uh, that are furnished, for example, by the Max Planck Institute to do different kinds of projects. Um, many people who come to ICLDC have invented very interesting videos and games that they use with speakers. Um, if you just capture more video with, with gesture, if there is gesture in your culture, it doesn't exist in all cultures, um, then these can be helpful to provide more context that you understand, and then you can better understand what's going on with the, um, the information in the target language. And then the fifth one is collecting, transcribing, and analyzing natural discourse. Now, it is standard practice today to at least gather some stories um, in the native language, some monologues, um, dialogues, if you can, that's a little bit harder to, to get, and to um, transcribe and translate those. I'm not convinced that everyone is actually analyzing all of that data that they get in that way. I recommend it, you will find. Um, a whole lot of interesting things in there that, that only come up in, in natural discourse. 
But this is not easy to do. It's not easy to do correctly. Transcribing is difficult, time consuming. Um, and you need a you need a one or more native speakers with a lot of patience to help you with this. And analyzing the data can also be very difficult, but well worth while. And I think we all need training in these things. Not all of these things are intuitively easy to use in a smart way. And I think we should try to add these to well, wherever we are trying to train folks to do field work. And, and those who are, I know a lot of people who are preparing for field work train themselves in a lot of ways um, by reading the literature and talking to folks. And we should make sure that we add this to the list of all the things that we wanna talk about. So this is my challenge uh, to everyone um, listening, to everyone in the field. And it's a pledge also for myself to try to do these things as well. I think using an IL can be uh, very worthwhile and, and um, very helpful in uh, doing work. I mean, there are a lot of places, China has a great need for field workers. There are not enough Chinese linguists doing this work. Um, and learning Chinese alone is a bit of an obstacle to get there. But if you have a decent grasp on it, there's a lot of good work that could be done, useful, valuable work, especially using these techniques. So in wrap, to wrap up, I just wanna thank all of the um, field workers who took this survey, I'm sorry, it's taken a little bit of time to see the light of day. And I wanna thank specifically the funders who helped me with my work in China. That was just the first of my field work projects, um, but I learned a lot doing that. And it's, it's ongoing, right? You never really stop documenting. Here are all of the references I listed in the previous slide. I will not go through them here, but uh, my email is on this slide and I am very happy to email that list and this presentation to anyone who wants to reach out to me directly. So with, thank, with that, I wanna thank everyone very much. And uh, in the live session, I'm now ready to take questions. Thank you.